humbly ask that we put our mobile phones on silent. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The president of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, the past presidents of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, vice president, fellows of the academy, honorable ministers, members of parliament, your excellencies, distinguished guests, students, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the President and Fellows of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, I warmly welcome you all to this evening's event. It is a tradition in the Academy and most institutions of higher learning to give their newly elected members an opportunity to deliver their inaugural lectures in their areas of expertise to their colleagues and the general public at large. This evening, we are privileged to have a scholar to speak to us on a very topical subject. This lecture used to be the Academy's in-house program, but because of its usefulness to our friends in academia and indeed to the general public, it has been made a public lecture since 1998. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce the chairman for this evening's event, who will take over from me and introduce the speaker. The chairman for this evening's event is Professor Kofi Opoku Inti, the Vice President of the Arts Section of the Academy. Professor Kofi Opoku Inti is a former Dean of the University of Ghana Business School. He has quite a varied academic background. He was a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics, a Master of Philosophy degree in Management Science, a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Operation, Operations Research and Economics, all from Yale University in the US. He has held academic positions in several universities, including Georgia Institute of Technology, Washington University in St. Louis, University of Cologne in Germany, Pennsylvania State University, London School of Economics, and the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He was the first occupant of the Unilever Chair in Business at the University of Ghana, Ligon. Professor Opokunti has extensive and highly technical publications that cover areas such as operations research analysis, management science, applied behavioral science, political economy, economic theory, and production economics an outstanding scholar and researcher. Professor Kupokuinti is a member of several academic societies, which include Public Choice Society, Institutes for Operations Research and Management Sciences, and the European Association of Industrial Economists. Professor Kupokuinti is an expert in the field of game theory and specialized in competition and strategy in business and economics. He is the Vice President of the Arts Section and a member of the Council of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Science, as well as a member of the Presidential Advisory Council on Science, Technology and Innovation. He's also a Director of the Investor Hospitals Group and Chairman of Claim Limited, and also Chairman and Managing Director of Lemont Foods Limited. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the Chair for this occasion, Professor Thank you very much, Professor Abo, for the warm introduction. 
And I welcome, all, I welcome you all to our first inaugural lecture for the year 2022. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Adams Bodomo. He is one of the speediest or the fastest to give his inaugural after he was inducted uh, last November. So I congratulate you on that. Well done. He's also going to talk about linguistic and Africanism as a global future. That obviously is a very intriguing and innovative topic because whenever we think of Pan-Africanism, we think of economics and politics. It's going to give us a new dimension on the linguistic and the cultural aspects of Pan-Africanism. Professor Adams Bodomo is a professor of African languages and literature at the University of Vienna, the first African to achieve that distinction at that esteemed European university. He was born in Jirapa and attended Nandom Secondary School from 1973 to 1980 before attending the University of Ghana, Legon from 1980 to 1987, where he earned a BA honors in linguistics, French and Swahili, as well as an MA in linguistics. He completed both the MPhil and PhD in linguistics in Norway and was appointed a part-time lecturer in Norwegian University of Science and Technology. He later took up a lecturership position at Stanford University of Science and Technology. He was also an associate professor in the School of Humanities at the University of Hong Kong. He's a founding director of an African studies program at the University of Hong Kong. Professor Bodomo has published widely in the most prestigious research journals in various fields. Among them are China Quarterly, Studies in African Linguistics, Lingua Studia, Studia, Lingua Studia Linguistics and Natural Language, and Linguistics Theory. He has done pioneering research in many disciplines, including African linguistics, Af Afriphone literature, diaspora studies, with a particular focus on diaspora community contributions to the socioeconomic development of their countries of origin, Africa, China, Europe relations, and interdisciplinary studies across many humanities and social science disciplines. He is the author of the first book on the African diaspora in China, called Africans in China by Cambria Press, 2012. He has also lectured and published widely on topics in linguistics and literature and on diaspora and international issues such as Africa, China, and West relations. He is the first black to occupy a top academic position in an Austrian university, holding the chair of African languages and literature at the University of Vienna, Austria, he has been the head of the University's Department of African Studies from 2016 to 2018, and is director of the Global African Diaspora Studies, GADS, research group at the University of Vienna. Professor Bodomo has won several prestigious fellowship and research projects. In 2011, he won a visiting fellowship to spend a semester at Stanford University's Humanities Center. And in 2012, he was a Beirut University he was at Beirut University. He has won several research projects from Hong Kong Research Grants Commission to do research on comparative African and Asian languages and cultures and to research the African presence in China. He belongs to several professional organizations, including being Time Life, member of the African State Association in America, the Linguistic Society of Hong Kong in China, and the Federation Internationale de Langue et Literature Moderne, FLI. FILLM, a UNESCO affiliate, where he is president from 2020 to 2023. We are still president. Contemporaneous, Professor Adam Bolancha Bodomo was elected fellowship of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences on 21st October 2021. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Bodomo to give his inaugural lecture. Thank you.
with this. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. Thank you very much. I think with this motivation, I don't need any more motivation to do a good job. Right? Yeah. Mr. Chairman, Professor Kofi Inti, Principal Officers of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, including President uh, Professor Sefa Dede, Vice President, uh, and also uh, Professor Kofi Inti, the Honorary Secretary, Professor Abo, uh, the Honorary Assistant Honorary Secretary, Professor uh, uh, Abo, and uh, staff members, especially Kate Wampong, um, Excellencies, members of parliament, um, distinguished guests and listeners, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen. I'm highly honored to be uh, begin my uh, inaugural lecture as a member of the GAS, that is Ghana Association of uh, Arts and Sciences, uh, I'm sorry, Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. And before I get to the text of my lecture, uh, permit me, Mr. Chairman, to acknowledge the presence of a few more people, and more specifically, um, I know I have colleague, colleague linguists distributed here and also in all parts of the world, uh, other academics in different parts of the world, including places like Ghana here, but also uh, places like uh, Europe, in Europe, Austria, in China, in the US, many other places in the world who are listening to me. Nigeria, I should mention that. Um, now, I also want to acknowledge my present and former students who are somewhere listening to me, both here and in other parts of the world. Uh, also both in person and on various uh, social media. My, my, my mentees and many other people. I may be a, uh, a fellow of the association, I may, be, I, I may be a professor at the University of Vienna, but I'm also a family person. My family member, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a brother, I'm an uncle, and uh, various other things to various people. So to my family members, thanks for coming. I feel somewhere there. Um, I now go on to the text of my speech. Um, as already announced, my title is Linguistic Pan-Africanism as Global Future, Reflections on a Language Question in Africa. Oh, I can read my slide. Oh, I think somebody should do it for me. A language Question in Africa. Um, and I'm presenting this on February 10th here in Accra at the auditorium of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, here is the outline of my talk. Uh, I'll in various places look at various aspects, including, you know, talking about a close relationship between the language question, as always been discussed in Pan-Africanism. And I also look at various aspects of how to implement a theory of Pan-Africanism in, in the educational sector using my uh, long established uh, principle of localized additive trilingualism. I'll talk also about uh, the, the language question in African literature, and I'll address issues about uh, how to promote African languages, not just only in Africa, but in all parts of the world. Um, so the, before, I get to, before I get to the details, I would like to begin with an anecdote. About 40 years ago, sometime in 1981 or 1982, I was an undergraduate student of linguistics at the University of Ghana. As an avid reader of the People's Daily Graphic, I saw an advert calling for essay submissions to the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences on the topic of a national language for Ghana. That means that the language question, the language issue has always been an important topic for the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. I did send in a submission in which I made a passionate argumentation in over 20 pages of typewritten. Those days there were no computers. You know, I had to do a typewriter and, and take it and write. You know, um, on the need to teach many indigenous Ghanaian languages as a basis for evolving a national language with vocabulary input from various Ghanaian languages, 
And I even had the audacity to call it a new name called Ghana Kasa. So that would have been the name for our, language, for our national language. Um, so 40 years later, today, after knowing my country better than I did as a young undergraduate, and after learning more about Africa and teaching Africa around the world uh, in many places, like in Europe, in North America, and in Asia, as a professor of African studies, I want to scale up the Ghana language uh, policies that I started many years ago. This, this I want to scale up this debate to a continental level. The major theme of this lecture is a passionate appeal, as, I've, uh, as I did 40 years ago, and as I have always done since then in my numerous publications on, and on this and related topics, is for the promotion and use of indigenous African languages in all sectors of society. African languages, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, should be used as languages of education, as languages for literary expression, and as languages in all institutions of government in Africa. Um, and in the spirit of what I say today, I begin by saying, I, I translate all what I say, I mean, uh, from this topic, in, in the following languages. So from today onwards, I want us to speak African languages everywhere. Uh, and uh, I'll just say it in my language, uh, my mother tongue, Dagari. Appeal is in a chagere, in Borala, Kati Yele Africa, Deme, Okore, Zieza. And uh, I could even try it in Swahili because I did Swahili for about a semester or so at the University of Ghana. Kwanzia Leo, Nataka, Tuzumgumze, Luya, Za, Ki Africa, Kila Mahale. So, and the, the listeners can say it in their favorite African language. Now, um, and indeed, the question of translation is very important. Uh, as many scholars have, have always said, the language debate, the language question has to always include translation, since we have so many languages. And I have already translated the abstract of this paper into five African languages. And there are plans to translate the whole lecture into 10 African languages. So Pan-Africanism, I begin with Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism is a dominant ideological notion in Africa and its diaspora. As a notion, it means that Africa, Africans, and all people of African descent can only stand to gain a better future um, if the continent and its people unite and pool their resources together socio-politically, socio-economically, and socio-culturally, which therefore means that there are several levels of Pan-Africanism. We have political Pan-Africanism, where we have uh, the African Union as a flagship institution here. Yeah. Political Pan-Africanism demands in many ways knocking down the mostly arbitrary borders imposed on Africa following the Berlin Conference of 1884, and thus to aim to remodel a borderless Africa. Economic Pan-Africanism uh, requires that we come together with the continental, uh, African Continental Free Trade Area, AFTA. I'm sure this acronym wasn't coined by a linguist. Yeah, AFTA as flagship, uh, as a, it's a crystallization of the many, many dreams of many Pan-Africanists, such as Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, Sekuturi of Guinea, Dafawa Balewa of Nigeria, and Julius Nyerere of Tanzania, to create a broader economic collaboration of all people of Africa. And indeed, the headquarters of AFTA is a state situated here in Accra. Now, uh, now this lecture uh, proposes and analyzes the notion of linguistic Pan-Africanism as an important aspect of the general notion of Pan-Africanism. Linguistic Pan-Africanism is a notion that encourages the management of Africa's linguistic resources towards better and more efficient communication um, and cultural development on the African continent. So without linguistic Pan-Africanism, it will be very hard to achieve political, economic, and uh, cultural Pan-Africanism. Linguistic Pan-Africanism, in my opinion, encourages the promotion of many indigenous 
lingua franca in the different regions of Africa, with the ultimate aim being possibly to create a pan-African lingua franca and Swahili stands a strong chance here. Swahili or what some pan-Africanists like me call Afrihili. Now, I want to connect this idea of pan-Africanism, of linguistic pan-Africanism, to an important idea of global future. What is global future? Global future refers to any major worldwide event that can potentially change some systems. One study by Utamaki describes global futures as referring to ongoing and emerging planetary scale processes and to their efficacy and real effects rather than to abstract clock time. She interrogates what then are the relevant global procedures which are open towards the future. Another study, Rosberg, talks of global future in terms of how global climatic conservation can be achieved for economic prosperity. They continue to say, to reverse nature's decline and, and for humanity to enjoy a sustainable and prosperous future, we urgently need transformational change across our economic and financial systems. So they are geared towards delivering long-term sustainable development and the protection and restoration of nature. We need to agree on a new deal for nature and people to reverse the loss of biodiversity by 2030, that is eight years from now, and put nature on a path to recovery for the benefit of people and planet. In this lecture, we want to view language as part of global ecology that must be preserved. And I will make the case for that as time goes on. Therefore, the claim is that evolving and implementing a cogent linguistic pan-Africanist policy can place Africa in such a strong position that Africa can create tectonic changes in the world as any global future does, and thus ensures that Africa successfully develops its economy and takes its rightful position in the committee of great nations of the world. The lecture interrogates aspects of these notions uh, with a view to addressing questions such as how can Africa place itself linguistically to compete economically and culturally? What are the strategies for evolving and implementing effective Pan-Africanist language policies to ensure that Africa has a bright global future? Um, we cannot talk about all these things without going back to the linguistics and philosophies of language. Language is always an interest, a central issue in this topic. So I'd like to begin the next session of my talk by looking a little bit about the nature of language. The nature of language as part of my uh, literary review on the theoretical and methodological aspects of the talk. Um, Language is not just only a system of communication, of coding and decoding signs. It is an important identity marker. Within linguistics and philosophical domains, language is often viewed as an object with which we use to interpret the nature and the world around us. And there's uh, even a strong claim, which is often called by linguists and philosophers, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, that the structure of one's language determines the way in which one categorizes and interprets reality. Language is also an important repository of our culture, and is indeed the medium through which we express various aspects of culture, like folk tales, songs, and dances. Just now you heard our songs and dances from my hometown, they were using uh, our, our language to express that. When you talk about Africa, the issue of uh, multilingualism also comes in. In a multilingual setup, as in the case of all African countries, um, the language question becomes a prominent issue. Each country, each region of Africa has a myriad of indigenous African languages and a substantial 
number of foreign non-African languages. African polities are quintessentially multilingual, and a large number of them, especially in Africa south of the Sahara, still continue to use former colonial languages as official languages and languages of education. The question then arises as to how to manage this situation. The classical position has mostly been to say that having so many languages uh, in, in each country is a problem. In the case of Africa, it is even often seen as the basis of ethnic tensions in much of Africa. Um, uh, and, uh, because in much of Africa, language is strongly tied to, ethnic, to ethnicity. Let's look into the broader issue about the languages, or how many languages do we have in the world? In a 2009 study, um, we found, it was found by, in the known languages of the world, it was found that there are over 7,000 languages in the world. And if you look at the diagram well, Africa is, has the second largest number of uh, languages in the world, only after Asia. So Africa has about 2,100 languages, while Asia has about 2,300 languages. So both Asia and Africa are very multilingual. Just compare that with Europe, which just has about less than 300 language, languages. So the ecology of language in the world is that there's so many languages in the world. And each of these languages are resources which people use to develop their society. Um, the next map is a map of Africa showing language families of Africa. Uh, like human beings, languages also have families. And we categorize them as such. Um, and in Africa, we have several language families, including the Afro-Asiatic, the Nilo Saharan, uh, Niger Congo, several two types of the Congo languages. One of them is the famous Bantu languages. We have the Khoisan languages. We also have the uh, Austronesian languages. Now, we may sometimes think that there's such a huge diversity in the world, but the next diagram for me shows that uh, of all, the, of all the, 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 the world's population, two thirds of the world's population speak only just 12 languages, the 12 largest languages as their mother tongue. So uh, the only 12 languages are spoken by two thirds of the world population as their mother tongue, including Chinese, Hindu, Arabic, Spanish, English, Bengali, Portuguese, Italian, German, Japanese, French, and uh, Russian. So as you can see, with the exception of Arabic, no African languages features in this. The next diagram is uh, a table showing the major indigenous African languages. And I've divided them into West African languages, Southern African languages, East African languages, Central African languages, North African languages, five, the five regions, the five economic regions of Africa. Which of these, uh, with West Africa having the largest number of languages, the most diversified, the most populous in, in, in Africa. All this goes to show that there's a strong idea of language diversity in Africa. And this language diversity is a double-edged sword. It can cut both ways. Um, on the one hand, each of these over 2,000 languages in Africa is the basis of a rich culture as uh, languages are the main media through which we express and convey our cultural values, as I said earlier. On the other hand, the fact that we have many languages within each of the 50-odd polities in Africa means that we face serious challenges and problems of language policy formulation and language planning. I must uh, emphasize that the languages themselves are not the problem. Languages are every language is always a resource for its people. So the languages themselves are not the problem. The problem is how, uh, the problem comes about, serious problem of how to decide, for instance, which languages to use in our national institutions. And it is this problem that has often led to uh, the idea that uh, the languages of the former colonial powers still dominate the linguistic uh, scenes in most countries of Africa, leading to inappropriate terminologies like Afriphone, 
Franco, uh, Africophone, Francophone, Lusophone, that is Europhone, African uh, countries of Africa. Um, the truth marked by these terminologies is that we indeed have clearly Afriphone and not Europhone countries in Africa, since the vast majority of the population uh, actually speaks African languages as mother tongue and lingua franca, languages of wider communication, but are rarely permitted to use these languages in the, formal education, in the formal education, especially at the higher levels and in other official settings. Um, so this is a general idea of the nature of language. And I want to get into, uh, begin to look at uh, a few things about the theoretical underpinnings of a theory of linguistic Pan-Africanism. So I want to propose a theory of linguistic Pan-Africanism. And in this theory, in this framework, I recognize four underpinnings. The first underpinning is that is a primacy of indigenous African languages. I believe that all the languages, indigenous languages of Africa are important tools for the socioeconomic and sociocultural development of Africa. Another underpinning is that I believe strongly in mother tongue education. Indigenous mother tongue education is an essential feature of the theoretical model of linguistic pan Africanism outlined here. Then I also have uh, what is called linguistic human rights. I interpret language rights in terms of human rights. And the important maxim of right of language and right to language, that's just two maxims, right of language and right to language. This uh, Ali Mazrui's terms that he has completely, he has always argued for. The right of language is saying that every community has a right to a language. So if a government has a policy that prevents a language, a community from using its language, it is against this right of language. But it's also the maximum of right to language. It's like that if a, an individual has a right to use the language they're most proficient in for their day-to-day -day activities and for economic activities. So thanks to Ali Mazri for these important terms. Um, the, the fourth underpinning of my theory of linguistic pan-Africanism is that as language diversity as a global future, coming back to our topic, there is a clear link between language preservation and environmental preservation. And I'm arguing that if climatic and environmental sustenance are important global issues, then language and its preservation are crucial parts of this global issue. So it's not just, we don't see language, the fact that we see plants and animals doesn't mean that uh, language, and we don't see language, doesn't mean that it's not a system. We need to preserve this system too in, the, in, the, in, the, in, that, in this constellation. Um, in terms of methodological issues for my work, for my, for my talk, it's based on several years of work that I've done uh, in, in my life as a, as a linguist. Um, the research presented here is based on different contexts of research involving a mix of qualitative and quantitative data collection and analysis method over a lifetime of observations and reflections on the nature of language and linguistic studies involving African languages. So a lot of archival research has gone into collating various data and, and ideas. This is also the basis of extensive debates in various fora. Um, coming back to the language question, question Pan-Africanism, is, as I said, one of the prominent concepts in the study of Africa and its place in Africa. So uh, there are two types of Pan-Africanism, as I often said. We just saw two various levels of pan but there are two types of Pan-Africanism. The Pan in the term simply means all. That is encompassing all Africans and everything African. A study by Shepperson and many other writers suggest that we should distinguish between two types of Pan-Africanism on the basis of whether we are dealing with a small p as in pan, as you can see on the screen, right? Uh, or whether we are dealing with a capital P as in pan. Now, what is Pan-Africanism with a big P, with a capital P? Pan-Africanism with a capital P refers to the body of ideas and literature evolved at formal meetings and congresses. In the 20th century, about five major Pan-African congresses were held 
in various cities around the world, from Paris in France to Manchester in the United Kingdom. It was at these meetings attended by prominent scholars and political figures from William Du Bois to Kwame Nkrumah that the key tenets of Pan-Africanism were discussed. I would add that the various efforts by African leaders to achieve political unity leading to the formulation, the formation of the African Organization of African Unity and the, the OAU and later, but which later got renamed as the African uni Union. So that is Pan-Africanism. It's more like government to government levels of uh, Pan-Africanism. But there's also a people to people levels of Pan-Africanism. So we'll call that Pan-Africanism with a small p. Comprises lower level manifestations of, um, the, of by people of African descent. So it means that uh, um, it comprises, uh, I mean, people of African descent, both within Africa and outside Africa. So in other words, I would add that at any time, a group of Africans and people of African origins decide to come together to address their interests, they are practicing Pan-Africanism, which is small p, so people to people Pan-Africanism. Um, the definition, therefore, we uh, choose to crystallize on in this talk is Pan-Africanism is an ideological notion that champions the need for Africa, Africans and all people of African descent to unite and work towards a better future for the continent and for Africans and all people of African descent. Now, the term Africa too has to be deconstructed, right? In my use of the term Africa, it covers I cover all the entire landmass of the continent and its islands. We do not make a distinction between the Maghreb and Sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, we avoid the term Sub-Saharan Africa altogether. In many European conceptualizations of Africa, especially the philosopher Hegel, there is this uh, keen attempt to distinguish between countries like Egypt, Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, Morocco, and the rest of Africa. In the spirit of Pan-Africanism, uh, Africa includes all parts of Africa, whether north or south of the Sahara Desert. So Africans in this context refer to citizens and indigenous peoples of all the countries on the continent, African continent, and most or all of whom are members of the African Union. Africans also include people of African descent who live outside Africa and who trace their ancestry and identity to the African continent. The term diaspora is often used to refer to these people. And some of the major names associated with Pan-Africanism is uh, uh, people like uh, Marcus Gavi, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, who I've mentioned several times, Patrice Lumumba, Amilcar Cabral, Tafawa Balewa, Sekuturi, Jomo Kenyatta, Julius Nyerere, Haile Selassie, Gamal Abdel Nazza, uh, Ahmed Ben Bella, Robert Mugabe, Nelson Mandela, Muammar Gaddafi, Thomas Sankara, and so on and so forth. And indeed, one of the most important and concise explanations of Pan-Africanism is by Felix, studied by Felix, who sees Pan-Africanism as a concept of uh, unity in diversity in terms of the extended and expanded African community. And I go on to sketch, a, to give a diagrammatical sketch of my theory of linguistic Pan-Africanism. You can see that this is a triangle with three levels, the base, the meso, and the apex. The base, as you can see, the base is where we talk about the diversity of the continent, the African, the mother tongue education, which involves all indigenous African languages. Um, the base is very important. It says that in the educational structure, every child should be given the opportunity to read and write and to learn and to study in their mother tongue. Incontestably, no, uh, you know, you know, this is uh, it's a very important aspect. And of course, whenever we talk about mother tongue, mother tongue is a very controversial thing. So I, I would like to say a few words about that. At a uh, recent panel discussion, also many other times, I stated 
for the umpteenth time that the best language policy for Africa, for anywhere in Africa, is one that ensures that every child is able to be literate and that is read and write in their mother tongue, or what language sometimes call the L1, that is first language. Um, I recognize that these terms are not problem free. The term mother tongue means uh, the language which a person has grown up speaking from early childhood. Now in my mother tongue, uh, L1 in Dagari, we use, and Dagari is a Mabia language in, North, in Northern Ghana, we use the term Tinga Kokore. In other words, uh, in other African languages like Akan and Hausa, it may translate as Krum Kasa or Martian, Harshan Garena, respectively. Now, one of the reasons someone might object to the term mother tongue or L1 is to say that while children in the urban centers of Africa grow up speaking many languages, making the term mother tongue or L1 problematic. Yes, it is problematic, and one must um, always unpack it. But here are the issues. First, it is not impossible to have two or more L1s or mother tongues in a multilingual setup. Second, and as a rural African, I grew up in Northwestern Ghana. As someone who grew up in a rural area of Africa, I sometimes get unsettled how some linguists or other social scientists try to impose what happens in the cities of Africa on all of Africa. One example that is often given is that a child in the urban centers like Nima, a suburb of Accra, may grow up speaking Ga, Hausa, Chui, and Eve at the same time. So what is their mother tongue? Now, the fact that this happens in the cities doesn't mean that it happens throughout Africa. In very many rural areas of Africa, and I must agree that uh, there are some rural areas by the roads or near cities that are also multilingual. I'm not saying they're not multilingual, but what I'm saying is that in some of these places, the term mother tongue is incontestably clear. The term tengekokor, mother tongue, refers to a specific language and it is unmistakable. Um, to complicate matters, uh, some Africans in the diaspora growing up in places like America, Europe, France, Germany, and part of their Pan-African nationalism, they feel somehow ashamed calling their most proficient language like English and French or German their mother tongue, and therefore we want to throw away the term. For that, linguists have saved them. Linguists have a term which is called the heritage language. What is a heritage language? A heritage language is for children in the diaspora. Your heritage language is or are your African languages, probably spoken to you by your parents at home. But English is your mother tongue. French is your mother tongue. German is your mother tongue. Portuguese is your mother tongue. I remember there was a debate, a, a literary debate between Professor Ngugu Watingo and, and many people, including his, one of his sons, who is of Swedish, whose mother is a Swede. And this young man kept on saying, okay, in my mother tongue, Swedish, while everybody else in the, in the, in the debate we're talking about, in our mother tongue, Gikuyu. So it was very interesting. So, so, it's, 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 so but uh, Professor Gugu's son, his mother tongue may be Swedish, but his heritage language is Gikuyu, right? So um, this is very important. In fact, I sometimes use the term language identity, language of identity. To, to solve all these problems. You know. So my language of identity, my Tinga Kokor, my Krum Kasa, my Mashin Garena is Dagari. Um, let's move on to the, to the meso level. Um, oh, sorry, no, no, sorry, I haven't put it there. So in, I am also surprised, and I also need to talk about indigenous African languages, because, because this is also contested. I am also uh, surprised at why some linguists question the term indigenous African languages. The term indigenous is a denotation that simply refers to an entity that originates or uh, occurs naturally in a particular locus, an entity which is native to a particular locality. Uh, any negative connotation or terms uh, that, uh, that res indigenous, indigenous result from a poor understanding of this denotation and cannot be a reason why we should abandon the term indigenous African languages. Any language spoken in Africa by communities of people whose original homeland is not traced outside Africa is an indigenous African language. Um, so, and I move on to the, the meso level, so where I talk about uh, regional lingua franca. And in this level, I am looking at I'm dividing Africa into the various regions, North Africa, East Africa, Central Africa, Southern Africa, as you saw earlier, West Africa. I'm talking about the kind of lingua franca that could be developed from them. The most important step, as I said, for all governments in Africa 
is to ensure that all children in Africa learn how to read and write in their Tenge Kokor, in their Kurum Kasa, in their Mashin Garena. Then at least one other language of their country. In fact, in the Achampong era, they had a very wonderful policy that said that every Ghanaian should try and learn another uh, Ghanaian language. That's the, that, the idea that is being said here. So Arabic, Amharic, Zulu, Lingala, Hausa, and each, each representing North, East, Southern, Central, and West Africa, respectively. These are some of the languages that could be learned as lingua franca. Other important languages in West Africa, which is the most diverse part of Africa, would include Bambara, Wolof, Akan, Ewe, Yoruba, and Igbo. And indeed, Bambara has been made a national language now in, uh, in, in, in Mali. And I want to move on to the, to the, to the apex of the triangle. Um, the apex of the triangle is where, so you can see the base is diversity. As we move along, we're moving into uniformity. So diversity and uniformity are both important uh, for linguistic, uh, for language policy. At the apex level, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, to propose uh, a, 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 a uniform lingua franca for Africa. The apex of the diagram indicates that Africans should agree on a single continental lingua franca. And the best candidate for this is Swahili. So far, it is the most widespread indigenous African language. It is also the most international African language, south of the Sahara, as it, and it is taught and broadcast in many parts of the world. The African Union could have a policy statement that by the year 2050, that is in the middle of the 21st century, a modernized form of Swahili called Afrihili or Ki Afrihili should become the sole language of the African Union, not just only a co-official language with English, French, and Portuguese. In fact, we should throw away English, French, and Portuguese as, as uh, official languages of the African Union and have only Swahili as official language. Right now, Swahili is just a co-official language with English, French, and Portuguese. It is not only, it should not only be taught in most universities in Africa, and I'm very proud of my alma mater, the University of Ghana. It is one of the few universities in Africa that teaches an African language, not, not being an Afri uh, Ghanaian language. So I learned Swahili at the University of Ghana 40 years ago. That was very visionary. So it should not only be taught in most universities in Africa, it should indeed be the medium of instruction in at least one university in each of the 55 African countries. Now, when we talk about Afrihili, Afrihili must not be thought of as only a linguistic touch-up of Swahili, but as a modernized form of Swahili that develops enough terminologies and concepts for the teaching of African history, culture, tradition, geography, philosophies, and so on. It would be important for all African children from different parts of Africa sitting in the same classroom to learn about traditional African heritages that is in a common African language, not in English, French, or Swahili. Um, so these are the three levels. And I'll go on. Now you, you have seen a, you have, have seen a curious idea of circles outside the level, uh, the, the, the diagram. I'm at each level, of course, I am not by this lecture saying that we should abandon every country learns foreign languages. Europe, Europe, European countries have their national language, but they also learn foreign language. The fact that Africa should have its own and consider its own language doesn't mean that we should avoid learning foreign language. So at each level, there is a provision for learning for foreign language education, as you can see in the diagram. So that, that's very important. It's not to say that we abandon, but we should not use foreign languages as our national language. We should not use foreign languages as our continental African language. Um, at every level, the base, the meso, and the apex of the triangle, there is an additional reference to African, to foreign language education, which is outside the, the triangle. These foreign languages include the current media of instruction languages such as English, French, and Portuguese in each of the so-called Anglophone, Francophone, and Lusophone African countries. Terms we reject in the theoretical model of linguistic Pan-Africanism. In fact, this is one of the first times that a language policy proposal for Africa does not accord a central position for Africa's former colonial languages. 
I mean, somebody may say that, well, this is wishful thinking, but let me say that it was wishful thinking when our ancestors were clamoring for slavery to end, but it became a reality. It was wishful thinking when our ancestors were clamoring for Africans to be independent, um, but now it is a reality. It may seem wishful now, but I believe that in future, Africa can have its own languages, as for languages of education and so on. That sends me to the fourth and fifth parts of my talk, and I, these parts have taken a life of their own, so I'm not going to spend too much time on them, except to summarize what I say in them. Um, in section four of my talk, I talk about how to implement the theoretical ideas of linguistic pan-Africanism in the educational sector based on the principle of localized additive trilingualism. Additive bilingualism or additive trilingualism says that you learn a language and then use that language to learn another language and carry on with that language such like that you go on. So you use both at the same time as equally. But subtractive bilingualism is what we have had in most of our educational system. You use your mother tongue to learn English, and from then onwards, you just drop your mother tongue and just use English throughout. That is subtractive bilingualism. I am arguing for additive bilingualism. So the second, the chapter, uh, section five of my, I call them chapters because the lecture has, has taken a lot of this into a book. So it's, there are chapters. Um, section five talks about how to address the burning question in African literature. And the question is, should we continue to use the former colonial languages as Chinua Achebe would want us to have, Chinua Achebe, the famous Nigerian writer, um, or should we increasingly use African languages as uh, Ngugu Wethiongo, the Kenyan writer, wants us to have? Of course, our answer is very clear here. African languages are the most prototypical languages to be used for writing by African, and all African writers should increasingly move to writing in African languages. And I move on to the fifth part of my talk. Uh, and that is where I begin to cue in the idea of linguistic pan-Africanism at a global future and also how to project, um, uh, how to project uh, Africa into the world. Um, we have already defined and explained the concept of global future as an event that can bring seismic changes to the world at large. Examples of global futures are um, or events and happenings that may have widespread effects on the world. These include climate change, and we have, we've had several levels of problem. They include migration, they include robotics, they include space technology, and they include blockchains. The maxim in these uh, climate conferences is always talking about our common future, meaning that all human beings have a common future, have an interest in managing these current happenings that can have major impact on all of us, our global future. Now, scholars like Vijay Prashad, who argue, they are, who they argue that the idea of a common global future may indeed be rather idealistic and indeed goes to serve Western interests more than the interests of the global South. We may indeed not have a common future with the West or a global North as a whole, as we, the people of the global South, have not even secured our present. So why talk about the future if you don't secure the present? If you don't secure the present, there will be no future. I argue here that language policy, language preservation in general, and linguistic pan africanism in particular, must be seen as an important aspect of our global future, of our survival for the future. So far, the topic of language preservation in linguistics and in other areas, or language revitalization, has not often featured much in issues of environmental conservation. And this is a great mistake. Linguists must make a clear link between the policy of language documentation, preservation, and revitalization as an important aspect of the global future phenomenon of climate and environmental preservation. What's the point in preserving trees and, anim and preserving animals whose names you don't even know any longer in your, in your language? What's the point? You know, so you, we need to, uh, these uh, values, human values, and the animals and the, and the, and the environment, they go uh, together, hand in hand together. Linguistic Pan-Africanism is an attempt to preserve, to revitalize, and to promote African languages as a way of to secure Africa's presence so that Africa can be prepared to take part in our common global future with other parts of the world. Um, I will now, at this point, begin to propose about three strategies for promoting African languages. The first one 
uh, one aspect of the rise of many of, of nations and parts of the world is that they take their languages with them as they rise. Linguistic issues are, are an important part of the foreign policy of rising nations. As Africa rises, and I believe Africa will rise, and as uh, African voices become more prominent in the world, Africa must not showcase itself in the medium of only English, French, and Portuguese. That is in the medium of the former colonial languages. Africa must go into the world in the medium of indigenous African languages. African culture and African soft power must be manifested in African languages. The first suggestion I give, I make is to create, uh, to establish African cultural institutes worldwide. And these institutes should be run not by foreigners, but by the African Union or the individual African polities. My proposal has been in many of, many of some of my papers has been to call them Mandela Institutes. Though, of course, we can also reserve some of them for other Pan-African icons like Kwame Nkrumah, Thomas, Thomas Sankara, Abdel Nasser, Malimu Julius Nyerere, or Tafawa Balewa. These Mandela Institutes would be mandated to teach African languages and cultures worldwide with a curriculum designed by a coordinating body in Africa that produces curricular content for the teaching of these languages and the cultures associated with them. We should also have standardized tests for these languages, a coordinating committee for creating standards for testing proficiency levels must be established. A standardized test called Test of African Languages as Foreign Language, Tal Talafol, must be established. The curriculum should be the same for all African languages, such that, for example, we can have Talafol Afrihili, Talafol Hausa, Talafol Yoruba, Talafol Igbo, Talafol Akan, Talafol Dabane, Nagare, Talafol Mori, Talafol everything. Of course, it might also be possible to find an African name for the test so that we avoid to use, uh, using the acronym Talafol. Funding should, be entirely, should entirely be from Africa and its diaspora. We must reverse the trend where foreign bodies from places like uh, Europe and China come to invest in Africa, create institutions for teaching us their languages to a situation where we create institutions and, and require them to learn our languages in order to ply their trade in Africa. Now, I also have a role for the African diaspora. I have I've had many meetings with several bodies and advised them on several issues concerning the African continent, the African diaspora. In one of these periodic African diaspora meetings, often facilitated by the African Union, stakeholders must agree on a five-year plan, say from 2025 to 2030, to encourage all second and subsequent generation African diaspora members to acquire a major African language in passing uh, Talaful Afrihili, Talaful Hausa, Talaful Zulu, and so on. This way, African languages will automatically become widespread all over the world. As someone who has advised the African Union um, and facilitated such meetings, it is my wish that one day before 2050, we would be able to hold our meetings completely in Afrihili. One of the best strategies for promoting African languages worldwide is if Africa gets its diaspora members speaking, reading, and writing African languages. I now begin to put the plane down and, and conclusion. Yeah. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm now beginning to conclude. I have so far uh, begun with a description of my terminologies, and I have outlined my theoretical underpinnings, and I have proposed a theory of linguistic pan-Africanism. Um, I will now talk about, and I've also talked about strategies for promoting African languages worldwide. I will now propose 10 recommendations, which are called 10 tenets of linguistic pan-Africanism as part of my conclusion. The first is that we must secure the base. We must be literate Everybody should be, every African should be literate in your, in your language of identity. Every African child should be given the opportunity to learn to speak, read, and write in their mother tongue or L1. 
or any of the languages of identity. The first tenet builds on Professor Ngu Wationgo's 216 study, um, where he talks about the importance of the mother tongue and beyond. The second tenet of the 10 tenets of linguistic Pan-Africanism is that we should evolve linguistic Pan-African policies. Most of all current national language policies in Africa are both nationalistic and Eurocentric, but not Pan-Africanist enough. For instance, one of the most important language, national language policies in Africa, the South African, um, the South African language policy, which was evolved under Mandela's rule, recognizes 11 languages, including indigenous South African languages, including Afrikaans, and including English, but not a single language beyond Southern Africa. Every African child must be given the opportunity to speak, read, and write in at least three languages. There are languages of identity, one African language, and Swahili, along with one international non-African language as an added bonus, not as a compulsory requirement. Tenet number three, um, language of literary expression. Every African writer should first and foremost endeavor to write in his or her language of identity or any other African language. Four, well, four tenant, regional Pan-African lingua franca. Every political economic region of Africa, North, Southern, East, West, and Central should evolve one, one to three regional lingua franca. For instance, Arabic in the North, Swahili, um, Ar Amharic in the East, Zulu in the South, Lingala in Central Africa, and House of Bambara and Wolof in West Africa. African languages as number five, uh, fifth tenant, uh, should be part and parcel of the service of Africa. Knowledge of an African language besides one's own is a requirement for serving in regional and continental level organizations. Tenet number six, avoid petty nationalism and Eurocentrism in national language policy. All national language policies attempt to be nationalistic, as I said earlier. Indeed, most are Eurocentric and few are Pan-Africanist in orientation. It is time to start seeing cross-regional language learning. For instance, it's not good to see East Africans learning West African languages and vice versa, North Africans learning Southern African languages and vice versa. Why is it that all African languages teach all the foreign languages, English, French, and no African language in each of the regions teaches languages from the other region, besides my own university, my own alma mater, the University of Ghana. Uh, tenet number seven, we should generously fund the African language agenda. Regional and continental level institutions and charity organizations and individual Africans should dedicate sections of their running costs to funding prizes and research grants for the promotion of African languages and literatures. Scholarship schemes should be set up for foreign students to learn African languages. When, when I was going to study in Norway and other parts of the world, I had to learn, I had to do TOEFL. I hope that one day somebody coming to study in Africa will learn Telephone. Tenet number eight, Africa, language of the diaspora. All diaspora Africans should be encouraged to learn to speak, read, and write Swahili, and eventually Afrihili, as it has the greatest potential of becoming the most widespread African language. Tenet number nine, on this on Afrihili. African linguists must work towards developing Swahili, the most widespread Pan-African language, into an official Pan-African uh, language called Afrihili, with a large segment of vocabularies from many African languages being part of the new language. Tenet number 10, African languages in the world. All foreign students who come to study in Africa, most people seeking permanent residence permits in Africa must be made to pass standardized tests in an African language. Um, getting to the end, let me just say a few things about challenges. Um, in preparing, Mr. Chairman, in preparing this lecture, a colleague who read through a preliminary version of the work asks why I am writing a 100-page lecture 
that no one will act on. He asked me if I trust the African Union or African governments that much to waste, to waste my time. Well, I'm not wasting my time. Well, my response is that as a scholar of African linguistics and literature, and as an advocate for the promotion of the use of African languages, it is my own my duty first to contribute to the body of literature on how we can do this. And then second, to advocate and campaign for the African Union and national and regional governments to act. Who knows what happens in the, in the next five to 10 years. A new era may come in which new actors at the African Union within and within national and regional governments will be looking into the archives for solutions, for answers to the language question in Africa. Um, a second challenge is that, uh, is that uh, the question is often posed to me whether I am not proposing a educational system in which children will learn too many languages. Well, it is not asking too much. My answer is that it's not asking too much to propose a pan-Africanist language policy involve, involving additive trilingualism in an already hyper-diverse a multilingual continent like Africa. In fact, many Africans already speak three or more languages. So all we are asking is for them to learn to read and write in these languages. It is not enough to just speak the language, you should be able to read and write in them. A third challenge is on the issue of resources. A question is often asked, where do we get money to amount programs in all these languages? Well, my answer is that, uh, it's a question of priority. A lot of money has been spent in teaching Africans how to read and write in the former colonial languages throughout Africa. If only we could spend even half of what we spend teaching English, French, and Portuguese in teaching African languages, there would be enough resources to go around in implementing our linguistic pan-Africanist model of localized additive trilingualism. Um, before I conclude, let me uh, acknowledge a few people who have helped me. I wish to acknowledge the following individuals and institutions without whom the lecture would not have been possible. All my, my Akan translations, Mandagari translations, Hausa translations, Swahili translations, Arabic translations, Amharic translations, different various people have helped me, and I won't mention all the names. Uh, my academic colleagues have helped me make comments on my work and uh, my uh, secretary at the University of Vienna has helped me with PowerPoint. And I want to thank the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the Bauer group from my hometown who came to perform. I want to thank everybody who has helped me in one way or the other in doing this. So, Baraka, Akwe, Midasi, Nagodi, Asante Sana, thank you. As you can see, the applause signifies the satisfaction of the audience in the journey you took them on this, this evening. Listen, this was a, a lecture of ideas, basically for you to imagine something that is not here right now. 
um, our lecturer, Professor Bodomo, obviously started very young, just like our students here. He started to construct a language for Ghana when he was an undergraduate, right? So it shows you that he has followed a particular path for a very long time. And so whatever he has to tell us is really eye-opening. I got many, many um, points out of this lecture. Um, for one thing, he told us that many, there are like global languages, languages that expand over big territories or capture a lot of people. And he says 12 languages are spoken by or are used by two thirds of the world. That is quite phenomenal. It is like the way certain phenomena just explode and agglomerate. Um, they call it Pareto distribution, where in this particular case, half a percentage of languages captures 66% of the world. Now, when you also look at it on a smaller scale, that is go to national scale or you go to uh, town scale, you might see similar phenomenon occurring. But because it's, we look at a global picture, we tend to see only the big things. But it's like that in many, many things, whether it's about wealth distribution, whether it's about the formation of big cities, mega cities, and the uh, movement of people, the thing that he calls uh, the global futures. All of these phenomena tend to agglomerate and um, have these kinds of, um, of basis. I was also interested in his, his, his theory of linguistic Pan-Africanism. Um, obviously, he has thought very hard about these issues. And the principles that he advocated are quite intuitive and very much um, uh, a way of building the foundation. Because he, he constructs the foundation as the, as the mother tongue, then he goes to regional lingua franca, and then he goes to continental lingua franca. But these are all ideas. It doesn't mean that it's here today, right? Because just like big empires, someday we have Rome and Rome is no more. Some, some, some big things can change over time. And um, the British were many, many years ago, they said their empire, uh, sun, sun never said on their empire. But it's no longer like that. So, so big ideas sometimes um, promote us to think fresh about things. I like this idea of linguistic human rights because I think it, it links very well with this idea of the mother tongue, that everybody should have a right to study and master their mother tongue. And people say that if you do that, it helps you to think clearly and, and you can get very good concepts. So we should not think that because we want to create an Afrihili, the mother tongue should disappear. And I think it's a very important foundation and the way he builds it up. Then there was the idea of the um, Mandela Institute. It kind of reminded me of what the Chinese are doing with this, uh, you know, the Institute, Confucius Institute. It kind of reminded me of that. And uh, he's, he's trying to say, let us form these centers where the issues of language, pan, pan African languages, and so on can flourish. And I think it's a, it's a great idea, and it should be um, somebody should, should, should start to work on it. Um, so the, the lecture, as you all heard, is, um, is very rich in ideas, and it gives, gives us an opportunity to think about language and how we communicate and how languages form and why some languages get bigger than others and the need for people to communicate and so on. So I want to thank our speaker for enlightening us on something that some of us don't think about, but he's a, he's a master of that. So thank you very much, Professor Bodomo. Well done.
Thank you very much, uh, Prof. And, and thank you, Prof., uh, for the brilliant lecture. Uh, we want to acknowledge uh, the presence of some schools, uh, Presec Legon, if they are here. And then we also have ATTC. And Achimota Senior High. Then Accra Wesley Girls. And then we also have Accra College of Education. We also want to acknowledge the support of uh, University College of Education, University of Education, sorry, University, University of Education, Winneba. I want to acknowledge the support <laughs> for this evening's uh, event. Shall we take uh, some few uh, announcements and we'll be out of here? So uh, we have an upcoming uh, inaugural lecture um, to be delivered by uh, Professor Richard Prempong. Pong, a fellow of the academy, and he will actually be delivering the J.B. Dankwa Memorial Lecture on the theme, The Digital World and the Future of the Ghanaian Legal System, Reflections Ahead, and it's Quintine, and that will be on uh, February 21st, uh, 23rd, uh, at, at the same venue at 5.30. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there will be a light uh, refreshment after this event, and we entreat all of you to stay behind and, and engage and interact and, and just network. So thank, thank, thanks to all of you for coming, and we appreciate your presence.